نحمده تعالى ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلوات الله والسلام عليه أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كلام الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار وبعد All praise is due to Allah We praise Him, we beseech Him, we seek His forgiveness We seek refuge with Allah from the evilness of our own souls and evilness of our actions Whoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guided them, there's no one to mislead Whoever He has led astray, there's no guide for them I publicly bear witness that there's no deity worthy of worship except Allah He is one and doesn't have any partners as I bear witness that Muhammad ibn Abdullah is a servant and his final messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So today, inshallah, uh, we, in our tafsir, we missed class yesterday. I apologize again for that. Um, I had an unprepared circumstance occur for me. I've been working long hours at my job and I thought I had a full tank of gas yesterday. <laughs> So when I went to get my car to come here, I saw it was on Beyond E. So I went to stop at the gas station and the car cut off and I went up a hill. So I had to wait for AAA to come gas me up. <laughs> so I apologize. <clears throat> so today we in our tafsir class. Understanding the Quran. And the last thing we covered was talking about how the Quran was, div- was revealed in the Prophet Mufarraqa. In Separate revelations in the process of 23 years And we talked about how the Quran was revealed to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And how he used that same method to teach it to his companions Radiallahu ta'ala anhu And then after that They began to teach that to the Sahaba Tabi'un, the followers of them Until to this time When it comes to learning the Quran from his proper people the Sheikh in the book, he began to strike examples of how why the Quran, as he said, Nazal al Quran Mufarraqan Hasib al Hawadif wa He said that the Quran was revealed in, in portions based upon circumstances that occurred. He said that the Quran was revealed in portions Based upon circumstances that had occurred and happened And the Quran would respond and would refute or clarify Some of the things that they didn't understand That was occurring to the companions And so they would ask the Messenger of Allah about it So the Quran would be revealed to deal with that وَكَذَلِكَ لِتَنْبِيهِ عَلَى الْأَخْطَاءِ and also the Quran will come down to give notification upon mistakes that occurred from the companions. When they did something wrong, Allah will reveal the eye. This is incorrect and this is how you're supposed to do. Which goes to show that our deen is based on change. That which is within ourselves with what that which Allah has revealed. The change that which has occurred from, to us from our families. That may have been wrong or incorrect Or what comes from our culture That may be wrong or incorrect That our religion came to correct that That's the point of the Quran The objective of the Quran is that it be recited Is that it be understood So you can rectify yourself And worship Allah based upon those things So here the Quran came down To remind the companions About the errors and mistakes that occurred to them As the companion Umar ibn Khattab Radiallahu anhu has narrated in Sahih Muslim, he said, when the revelation used to come to come down, that we didn't use to correct one another. Because if someone was wrong, the Quran would correct us. The Quran would correct us. Then when the revelation ceased, when the revelation ceased, we used to correct one another with the book of Allah and the Sunnah of his Prophet. 
He said, if we saw someone's actions, statements, and agreement with the book of Allah and the Sunnah of, Sunnah of his messenger, he said, ahbabnahu, we would love that person. وَقَرَّبْنَاهُ إِلَيْنَا And we would draw him close to us. And if we saw his actions in opposition to the book of Allah, we would dislike this person. And we would separate from him and keep distance from him. So this is how they used to deal. And it's our job to imitate that in our time, which is going to be based upon knowledge. So the sheikh, after saying that, he says, We're going to strike some examples for this. After he said, الدرس, he said, and Allah will reveal verses so they could take lessons, well, ibra, an admonition for things that had occurred. So it came down to correct the mistakes. It came down to give admonition and to teach life lessons, as the Sheikh is saying. And he strikes an example of that occurring during the time of the Prophet. He says, he said, after the Muslims, numbers became abundant and the strength of the Ummah became strong. They thought after this strength, after these abundance of numbers, after this after these numbers and preparation with having the weaponry and being able to match their enemies, they thought that is enough, enough to attract victory against the enemy. They thought and believed the companions, the Muslims at that time, during the time of the Prophet, they thought once their numbers became strong after they had conquered Mecca, they had Medina, they done conquered Mecca, now the Arabian Peninsula in that area was all upon Islam. They thought they were strong and powerful and unbeatable because of their numbers and their, as they say in Arabic, their adad and their udad, because of their numbers and because of their weaponry preparation and war skills that they had developed. And strength that they had achieved. So they thought they, that would attract victory. To the point one of the companions had said. And this occurred during the Ghazwatul Hunayn. The battle of Hunayn. And the battle of Hunayn took place right after the Prophet had conquered Mecca. Right after the Prophet conquered Mecca. And they went to go face the enemies. And they were in great numbers. The Sahaba. So one of the companions said, after on their way to, to face their enemy, He said, we will never be conquered because we don't have a few numbers, meaning we have a lot of numbers. We'll never be defeated. We'll never be defeated. So because of this thought pattern, now before we move on to go on to give the example how Allah reprimanded them and corrected them in this issue, what is wrong with believing you're going to win against your enemy if you have a lot of fighters, soldiers, and you have proper preparation and weaponry? Why are we not allowed to believe that that is the thing that's going to attract victory against our enemy? What's wrong with this statement? Before we mention it, let's see if we'll, we'll come from your brothers. Oh, there you go. That's what we wanted to hear. Because... The reliance is not on Allah. The tawakkul is not on Allah. It's on my numbers. It's on our preparation. Well, next question. Does that mean that we shouldn't have long, large numbers in preparation? We just rely on Allah? We should have, if we can get them, we should have them. That's right. We should still, we call that in belief in tawakkul al Allah. I always like to bring the aqidah aspect of our belief in these issues. Because this is what the ulama do. And it's my job to follow our ulama. The ulama have taught us that tawakkul ala Allah is based off of two things. Al-amal bil asbab wa tawakkul ala Allah. Working by the means to achieve things that is available, but only relying on Allah. While only relying on Allah. Your reliance is only on Allah. You don't look at your reliance on this, the means that's, uh, the, to achieve something. But you work by those means, but you don't place your reliance and your belief that this thing is where the victory is going or the, the success is in that. These are means. The ends is Allah. We say, we na'mala bil asbab, wallahu al asbab. That we, be, we work by the means that is available to us to achieve things, but we realize the one who caused those means to exist is Allah. 
So the success is only in his hands. How many times a person did all his preparation, all the things that's necessary to achieve something, didn't achieve it. Because it wasn't written for him by the musabib al-asbab, by the one who caused the things to occur around us. And this is paramount. As a Muslim, we take on this belief in all of our affairs. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to teach the lesson to the companions because what happened, the people that they went to go fight against, what they did was they was living in a mountain pass area, a place that's a valley where you got mountains surrounding them. So what they did was the enemies, they went and hit in every mountain spot in crevice that they can hide in all the warriors of the kufar and they because the muslims is coming to them to fight so when the muslims enter, entered they came out and rained down on them arrows and spears and brought the attack onslaught real hard fighting the muslims after they was coming there let no let we will never be conquered i'm killing from because of us only having a few numbers we have a lot we have a large amount of people we're going to defeat. So Allah Ta'ala is the Sheikh said, al-Muslimina That Allah caused the Muslims to taste defeat. And then the Kufar almost eradicated the Muslims in that battle in the beginning. And after this the defeat and Nakara, this negative defeat. That occurred, Anzal Allahu Sakinatuhu al Muslimi. That Allah descended His tranquility upon the Muslims. Because when it happened, all that started to occur when they arrived in the place where the battle was taking place, it was just overwhelming. So the Sahabas <laughs> broke camp and left the Prophet standing there, except for Abu Bakr, except for Umar, except for Ali, except for Uthman, except for some of the, the ten Mubashirin. Ali ibn Abi Talib, they, walk, they didn't move, they stood ground. And the Prophet Sallallahu began to recite some ayats and ordered them to come back. And they came to their senses after that initial fear and they came back to defend the Prophet and they gained victory over their enemies and defeated them. But Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala taught them a lesson and this was in the place called Hunayn. So the battle was called Ghazwatul Hunayn, the battle of Hunayn. As Allah Ta'ala revealed in Surah At-Tawbah وَيَوْمَ حُنَيْنٍ إِذْ أَعْجَبَتْكُمْ كَثْرَتُكُمْ فَلَمْ تُغْنِ عَنْكُمْ شَيْئًا وَضَاقَتْ عَلَيْكُمُ الْأَرْضُ بِمَا رَحُبَتْ ثُمَّ وَلَّيْتُمْ مُدْبِرِينَ Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says the day of Hunayn Remember when you was amazed by your numbers and it didn't avail you any whatsoever. And the earth became restricted upon you in spite of its spaciousness. And then you turned on your heels and your back towards the Prophet fleeing. So Allah Ta'ala admonished them. And so the Shaykh give this example to show you how the Quran will come to deal with real life scenarios. To teach them how to believe, how to apply this religion to life. Something we don't know and have not experienced except through reading and admonition and coming to classes and learning the religion. As Sheikh says after this, if the Quran had been revealed all at one, one whole sum, there was no way possible if the Quran was revealed all at one time to the Prophet that an admonition, a notification, Attention can be brought to the mistakes of the Muslims. And them being deceived by their numerous amounts and numbers. So this is how the Quran will come down to deal with affairs. So now, the first question should come to mind. Here you got the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Who was present as these verses five and ten verses at a time are being revealed to deal with real life situations. Right? And then the messenger of Allah, Sallallahu would then in turn teach them. Now, we got to think. The Quran was not revealed to the Prophet all at one time. So, it was no verses 
in sorters, in its structure and order, except a few. It was coming as the years went by. This is why when we learned at the end of the Prophet's messengership, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Quran was revealed to him. And al Jibril came down to him and said, put this verse and through the whole time, take this verse and put it here, match it with this verse, put this order here. He told him what to do, told the messenger of Allah. He in turn would tell the Sahaba this, right? To the point, we know the last verses to be revealed to the Prophet is from Baqarah in the beginning. And the first verses to be revealed to the Quran is in the end of the Quran now. Which shows this is was done with in deep wisdom from the Creator. Here he revealed the Quran to Baytul Izza in the sky, the whole Quran. Allah, because this shows how Allah knows Allah is not restricted by time, you know? Like we're restricted by time. Allah is not restricted, His knowledge is infinite. Is what occurred already was going to occur, and what could occur that will never occur. He know what would have happened if that was to occur. That's how infinite the knowledge of Allah is. So Allah revealed the Quran, sent it to Baytul Izzah. Then He had Jibril bring it to the Prophet in peace mills, revealed as we see it today in the Baytul Izzah. Prophet didn't know it was going to be like that, but it dealt with scenarios. Then Allah would tell him, put this verse here and this verse here. So this Quran. And this is what I'm trying to impress upon us to see that the, um, the wisdom of this book is far reaching, it's ending, its benefit is nonstop. That's why the Salaf and the Sahaba used to say if you want to this dunya, know the Quran. That, the problem is, like Allah Ta'ala says, Wa anzalna kitaba li We have revealed the book as a clarification for everything. The Quran is a clarification for everything, but the problem is us not attaching ourselves to it, not reflecting over and pondering over it to the extent we can find it some type of benefit in it for every single thing. Because Allah said he revealed the book as a clarification for everything. Allah says we have not felt negligent in anything in this book. It's just that we're the negligent. We're the ones who deprive ourselves of this tremendous benefit. Like we said before, it was a Muslim doctor. And I love to tell this story and many stories that's like this we've learned. A Muslim doctor was the one who discovered we had a nervous system. Well, we, that there's a, a nervous system under this skin that enabled us to feel. He learned that from the Quran. He read the verse in Surah to Ali Imran. كُلَّمَا نَضِجَتْ جُلُودُهُمْ بَدَّلْنَاهُمْ جُلُودٍ غَيْرَهَا I know that's Surah, excuse me, I see Nisa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Every time their flesh become charred and burnt, we replenish it with a new flesh in order that they may taste the punishment. So he was reflecting over this verse. How he reflecting over this verse? Because he had an everyday habit of finishing, of reading so much portions of the Quran and reflecting over it. A doctor. This was at a time. Now I, I wanted to tell this story because it's directly connected to why we're in the rut we are in today as an ummah. How a doctor had this insight into the book of Allah when he wasn't a scholar. He wasn't a student of knowledge. How was he able to see this in that verse? Because the basics of Islam like some of the shayukh have told us, the time we're living in today, what would be used to be a regular Muslim in the past would be a student of knowledge today, probably. Would be considered a student of knowledge today. What a regular Muslim had in the past. Because in the school systems, as an example, your child go to school by the time he get to the eighth grade, he done memorize a book like the Mawatta of Imam Malik. He done memorize, he done learn al I mean, these books of grammar and fiqh. And this is a regular person. The ones that excel became your scholars and your students in knowledge. The ones that didn't excel in it but still had it became your engineers, your regular store owners, your regular people. 
But the deen was so strong. This is to the point, Khalifa to Harun, Rashid, I mean, one of the rulers of the past that was from the rightly, from the um, Umayyad period, because, you know, we have a periods of rulership in our Islamic history. The beginning was on prophetic, was the prophet rulership, then then government based off bin Hajj and Abu, a prophetic way of life that was a five rightly guided caliphs. Then you had the um Umayyad period that was Muawiyah and his family. Then after him was the Abbasiyah period, like this. And then after that, you had the different groups until we had the Uthmani period or the Ottoman Empire, as they call. So like this, we should know our history like this. So in the Umayyad period, that the average Muslim had knowledge of it. To the point, Khalifa Rasha used to have this Jewish man that he used to give da'wah to. A scholar, a hibr, a scholar of the Jews from the Ahbar. From the scholars of the Jews And he was trying to call him to Islam The ruler, he had a relationship with him And then Allah caused them to be separated For a period of time And then he sees this man later on in his life The ruler sees him later years, Some years later And when he sees him again He finds that he's a Muslim And he asked him What made you, how did you, why did you, what made you come to the deen? What happened? After you know, I was, he was trying to call you You didn't So what happened? He said, well you know I knew Islam was the truth, of course, but I wanted to take a final test to see how well Allah preserved the book, the books, the three books, the Torah, the Injil, and the Quran. The Injil of Isa, the book for the Christians, the Torah, the book of the Jews, and the Quran, the book of the Muslims. So he said, he took each book and he put interpolations into them. He added words, things in it that was not from it. Because in all of the books that you find Allah has cursed the Jews Because of their disobedience to their prophets and messengers And their murdering of them So he said he took every verse that spoke bad of the Jews In all three books And he changed it to being something praiseworthy And then he would take the Quran and give that made up copy those, With those interpolations and changes He would give it to the Muslims And he took the portions in which he made the changes about the Torah, the book of the Jews, and gave it to the Jews, and he took the ones, the Injil that he made changes in, and gave it to the Christians. And he said, I wanted to see who would notice this from amongst the three religious groups. He said, the only people broke that book, brought their books back were the Muslims. Saying, this ain't the Quran. This ain't the Quran. And he's not talking about the scholars of the Quran. Many Muslims, we so warped from our own religion, we think, in order to be to learn the Quran, I gotta be want to be a scholar, or it's only for my children. So he said, every average Muslim was bringing us. This ain't the book of Allah. This ain't the book of Allah. Would that happen today? Would that happen today, brothers and sisters? Can you look at your own family and say if that happened to them and they read the Quran, would they be able to do that? I don't want no answer. I want you just to think about that. It's a rhetorical question. So this is what occurred. And the man, he accepted Islam. He said, the Jews didn't bring their book back. The Christians didn't bring their book back. So I knew Allah was preserving this book. So I knew it had to. That was my final straw, straw that determined for him that this was the book of, this was the deen that Allah preserved. So he accepted Islam. So again, the point in this example is to understand how the Quran was a part of the life of the Muslims. It was an integral part of their life that we have to fix that in our own lives, our own individual selves. So the Sheikh Hafizahullah, he says, if Allah again had revealed the Quran all at one time, it would have never been possible to give a, a reprimand or, or a notice to the mistakes of the Muslims and their deceptions, even though the verse was revealed already before the incident happened. That's what I want you to get to. It goes to Beit al Izza. Hear this verse. The day of Hunayn. This is almost at the end of the prophet's prophecy. Right? Last couple months, couple, because he died a few months after that. Three months after he made his final hajj. He died, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah revealed in his eye within those last three months. But it was already built, revealed in Beit al Izza. Which go to show how can a Muslim fix his mouth to say... This religion ain't applicable today. Or this religion ain't for today's times. A'udhu billah. Allah's knowledge knew 
what was going to occur. So he revealed his final revelation to fit all scenarios. And he caused his messenger to go through what was necessary that was going to be for the verse to be revealed. Allah's wisdom is infinite. Allahu Akbar. Your trust in Allah should have increased. Wallahi. He says, وَمِنْ أَهَمِّ الْحُكُمْ أو حكم التي نزل من أجلها القرآن مفرقة. He said, from the most important of wisdoms in which the Quran was revealed for its sake in proportions, he had تدرج في تشريع الأحكام is the wisdom of it was being revealed in piecemeals and portions so that Allah will gradually send down legislation relating to scenarios. He says, He said, we shall mention for you, my young brothers and children, the story of the prohibition of alcohol. Now, I want y'all to look at history. No nation was able to illegalize alcohol and keep it established except Islam, except during the time of the Prophet. Everybody, let's look at our own country. They illegalized alcohol and it didn't work. That's how mafia made massive money all off of alcohol. And the government said, wait a minute. We illegalizing this. People still drinking. They still, you know, all these drug dealers making money. We need to legalize this and we control the money. They couldn't solve the problem. But the messenger of Allah, well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala solved that problem amongst the, the Muslims during that time. In spite of the fact Saudi Arabian Peninsula at that time, as we go on today, loved alcohol. The poet Arabs used to write poetry about the benefits of alcohol and what the love they had for alcohol. And yet, they eventually walked away from it because how Allah prohibited it in stages. Dealing with this scenario, which goes to show how Allah knows his creation. He says, He said, this story makes apparent how Islam was successful in that which every nation failed in, in relation to prohibiting alcohol. He said, whereas every nation was enabled to prohibit alcohol and to, to eradicate addiction to it. They weren't able to do it, but the Prophet was, a, was able to do it through this Quran. So it's important to understand how Allah dealt with it and why this is important for us now. Because it's important when it comes to giving da'wah, when it comes to new shahadas, and how to deal with them. Because I like, I get a lot of Muslims that come to me, right? They new shahadas. She, she or he accept Islam, and then shortly thereafter, you find them back on what they was on as non-Muslims, or totally just left Islam altogether. The statistics for that is very, very high. I don't know if y'all read this article who has been written and research that has been done on the abundancy of Muslims who accept because they say Islam and no doubt still is to this very day it's the fastest growing religion on the earth. At the same time, it's probably the fastest religion people leave into from amongst the new Shahada. A great percentage of it is from that. And a great percentage is of Muslims who come from Muslim country who their Islam was their culture and not Islam. And so their culture was mixed with Islam and they saw the corruption of things in their culture and they were tagged it against Islam and they leave Islam because they never knew it from the beginning. And the Muslims in their country, they turned the worship of Allah into a culture. And so because they don't know what Allah and his messengers say in relation to those issues, they made it up culturally and it got worse with each generation and going further away from what Allah intended. That it chased people like I know of a woman right now, Arab woman, who makes a campaign against Islam to this day. Born and raised Muslim in a Muslim Arab country. She left Islam because she saw her cousin forced into marriage to an older man that she did not want to be with. And so she so her family made her marry this man. She set herself on fire and killed herself. It made the girl leave Islam, seeing that happen to her cousin. Say Islam ain't for us. For men, this is an oppressive religion because she associated the religion 
to the actions of people who they made it seem like this is our deen. This is the reality we live in today because people don't really know Islam. When the woman, we know the famous hadith, when the man brought his daughter to the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he said, oh, messenger of Allah, I told my daughter to get married and she refuses. So the prophet looked at her, he said, ati'i abaki. He said, obey your father. She said, la hatta tubayyin li haqqu zawj ala zawja. She said, no, not until you clarify for me the right of the husband over the wife. And so the Messenger of Allah وسلم, knew that this woman wasn't asking the rights like when he you supposed to obey him. You post, not like he, that wasn't what she was looking for. She probably knew that already. She was looking at the great right, the severity of that right, how serious it is with Allah. That's what she wanted to know. Because she knew the eye where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Verily, for the women of rights is similar to that which is over them as rights. Right? But the right of the man over the woman is greater. And then Allah tells the women who don't want to hear this, especially women who is affected with feminism. Allah says... Wallahu al-azizul hakim And Allah is the almighty Meaning to execute those who don't follow this order And punishing them Al-hakim And he's the all-wise And knowing this is more wise for you Than what you think O feminist So when the prophet realized This is what the woman Looking for the severity of this man's right with How severe is in Allah With Allah this is what she meant Because the answer he gave Wasn't the answer you would expect Which is indicative That this woman was looking for The severity of that right And the prophet said That if he was to have a wound And pus was to come from it And you was to lick it Or snot was to come from it Or you was to lick it off You wouldn't be fulfilling his, his rights To show her severity The right of the husband is over the wife so she led, she said, La ankahu abada. I never get married. So the Prophet turned to the father and to the men of the Ummah said, La tunkihuhunna illa bi idmihinna. He said, Do not marry the women except with their permission. And here we come today, forced marriages. Because they don't know their religion. So the Shaykh Hafidahullah, he goes on, he says, this story teaches us this lesson. He said Islam was very protective and guarding over the, the, the gradual curing of something. And in trying to prepare the Muslims for this prohibition. He says because the souls of man because the soul of human beings can truly become accustomed, severely accustomed to something that they just can't leave it. What in a darajatin it man to the point it can reach the level of an addiction. For kanala Buddha, so therefore it is a must be an yata'amil Islam had al Amr that Islam must treat this affair. بتدرج, with gradual treatment to it to fix it وحرص, And diligence To stay on top of it And that's what the Quran did And likewise we're supposed to learn lessons for this In giving da'wah to each other And also in teaching us how to gradually teach your children So that they can grow upon iman The way Allah intended them to grow Because as we said you'll see a Muslim Take their shahada, and I've seen it. I know one particular sister, she took a shahada, and she came to me. She was gun ho you know, people, iman, be high when you first take a shahada, which I've seen, alhamdulillah, I never experienced that. I took my shahada when I came out of my father's, my mother's womb, alhamdulillah. And I remember every Muslim, they seem to tend to be 
if they accept Islam out of their love of Islam, because unfortunately you see a lot of women accepting Islam is to marry a man, or vice versa, a man accept Islam. I just got a phone call yesterday. A brother called me, his daughter slipped up and fornicated with this kafir, and she said to him, just say, Shadu an la ilaha illallah, Shadu an Muhammad Rasulullah, we get married. So he went and did it, but the father ain't stupid. He'd been now on his shahada for over a year. Almost a year, and this boy ain't prayed once, fast once, did anything. And I told him, I said, the ulama say, when a person take their shahada, they have to show something in, of, that they are Muslim. Some asked, did he pray? I said, did he pray sometimes, or one, two, three times? Did he fat and do anything? No, never nothing. I said, well, he's not a Muslim. He's not a Muslim. So these things, people play with Islam like this. And it's required to have knowledge and knowing how to deal with these affairs. Those are imma of the masajid. So in any case, we see stuff like this. Person take their shahada, gun ho, right? With zil. They come to Islam. They want to do everything. And unfortunately, because we don't understand tadarruj, gradual growth. Upon this deen Like we're about to cover right now Some aspects of it You'll see another Muslim Tell a new shahada This haram You can't do this Sister you gotta do that Brother Stay away from that It becomes overwhelming for them Why? Because they don't even know Who Allah is They understand The messenger of Allah how Allah dealt with building their iman, learning about the akhirah, learning about Allah, his names, his attributes, how he deal with his creation, how he created everything in the beginning and how things strayed from that. Teaching these things to a person first. Yes, you could tell them Islam says this is haram. Islam says this is you should, but for you, you need to know about Allah. You need to learn about Allah. But understand this is Islam position. You will understand the wisdom of it later. So the focus ain't that. Because what happens is if you come to a person, you say, you better do this now. This is haram. You got to do this and you can't do that. They do it because that's what you told them to do. Then when they go through something difficult in life, they go right back to what they used to. I mean, I can't feel in that Islam stuff, man. Get out of here with that. You wouldn't believe how many scenarios that I've come across. Too many to enumerate. So I told the sister, I said, sister, just focus on learning about Allah. Learning about Tawheed. Read the verses about Tawheed. Read about this. Hellfire. Like this. Learn. She didn't listen in the beginning. She just went gun ho Then she went through a severe trial. Next you know, I see her walking down the street uncovered. I said, what happened, sister? I was just overwhelmed. and da, da, da. I should have listened to you. Da, 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 da. Like that. Everybody in my ear telling me this is what you're supposed to do and you can't do this. And, Allah Mustaan, brothers, we got to stop that. Sisters, we have to stop this. So let's look at how the Messenger of Allah dealt with the legislating of this issue. And we want to read from Sheikh Ibn Baz instead of from the Sheikh in the book. I like the way Ibn Baz does it, it's, more, it's clearer. But the stages, Sheikh Ibn Baz says, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. Sheikh Ibn Baz, he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the prohibition of alcohol. I'm translating directly from the Arabic. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the prohibition of alcohol on state based on, on stages. Just as you've heard. The first stage is aqarrahum alayha. That Allah confirmed that alcohol had a benefit. And he didn't prohibit them from it when they was in Mecca. And likewise, while they was in Medina, in the first beginning stages, Allah confirmed the drinking of alcohol. And that, that is because alcohol with the Arabs, it had a major status in the society, as they do here in America. And they would write, they would write poetry in relation to it. That's how much they loved it. And they will occur for them severe, astonishing trials and strange things. Sheikh Ibn Ibn says that from the wisdom of Allah is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala delayed the prohibition of it because of the abundancy of the people 
who drink it. That if Allah had made it haram in the beginning, is Sheikh Ibn 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 Farubba Mam Tana'a Min Dukhulihi Islam, then perhaps that would have hindered them from entering the foes of Islam. Allahu Akbar. This would have prohibited them from entering the foes of Islam. Min Ejdiha. Woman Rahmatillah, and from the mercy of Allah, is that He delayed this prohibition. Until the people entered into the religion of Allah Meaning As we say in Arabic In their hearts and upon their limbs And until the point the Muslims numbers became strong Why did Allah wait that long To prohibit it in totality Because we are social people man We are influenced by our environment we are influenced by what we look at the most and what we be around. I don't care who you are. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came with the prohibition when the influence was strong of the environment, of the haqq. So Shaykh Ibn Ibaz continues, rahimahullah. He says, حتى كثر المسلمون He said, even to, he said, until the point the Muslims' numbers became abundant. وحتى عرفوا Islam Until the point, he, well, he said, he waited until they really knew Islam. وطبع أمنوا إليه And they found tranquility in Islam. We are not like this, most of us today. We don't find tranquility in Islam anymore. We find tranquility in what our eyes see in this, these kufar shows us. Because we don't know what's up. We're supposed to study it until we find that tranquility too. We got to read it and read it and go over and go over it until we feel that. And likewise with our children. Listen what Sheikh Ibn Ibn is saying. He said Allah waited to give the, delayed the prohibition until the, the people entered into the deen of Islam. The, till the numbers of the Muslims became much and until they knew Islam. And they found tranquility in it, meaning in the application of it in their life, in its belief system. He said, and then the prohibition graduated after that until the point the people left it out of contentment. They found contentment in leaving that. They, they did it out of wisdom and, un, and un, deep understanding of why they got to leave it. He says, so Allah clarified this for them. Firstly, in his statement, when he said, and this statement was because Umar ibn Khattab came asking the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, about the prohibition of alcohol. Umar ibn Khattab he came to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And he asked him He said Ya Rasulullah Akhbirna anil khamr He said O oh, Messenger of Allah Inform us about alcohol Fa innaha mudhibatun lil aqal Because it tends to remove one's intellect Mudhi'atun lil mal And cause one to waste his wealth Wa munhikatun lil jism And it tires out the body Meaning makes the body sick so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when the Prophet asked that question, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verse in Surah Al-Baqarah. يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْخَمْرِ وَالْمَيْسِرِ قُلْ فِيهِمَا إِثْمٌ كَبِيرٌ وَمَنَافِعُ لِلنَّاسِ وَإِثْمُهُمَا وَإِثْمُهُمَا أَكْبَرُ مِن نَفْعِهِمَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verse. They asked you, Muhammad, about alcohol. And gambling Say In the both of them Is a major sin And a benefit for the people And the sin of the both of them Is greater and worse Than the benefit of the two of them Verse 219 Surah Al-Baqarah So at this point In Allah saying that Something of his prohibition Began to become in, in, in the hearts Occur in the hearts of the believers it wasn't prohibited, but the idea of it being prohibited settled in their heart. And they realized the sin of it is greater. And that was because knowledge of Allah began to settle in the heart. 
knowing your purpose of why you've been created begin to settle in the heart. Understanding what Allah wants from is better than what you will want for yourself. Begin to settle in the heart. So when Allah knowing that this was the speech of Allah was undoubting in their hearts. So when Allah says, Ithmuhuma akbarumin nafihima, its sin is worse than its benefit. And so Shaykh Ibn Baz rahimahullah he says, it occurred in their hearts its prohibition, and that his sin was worse and greater. And that Ennamakada bihadi mafaba fayambagi tarku. He said, so begin to be, understand an intellect of some that leaving it is, is more suitable. But many of the people didn't leave it. For this reason, So they had wanted to be revealed something that was more clear in relation to this issue about alcohol. Since... Allah said the sin of it is greater than the benefit. They wanted to know. It became a desire now. Well, what's the situation? Why is it more sinful? What, 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 they want to know. So now they want to hear guidance. They want to, they want to know. And so Shaykh Ibn Baz, rahimahullah, he began, on, he began to say, then after that, He said this is only because they begin to see the severe Ties that they had to alcohol and the trial and fitna that it gave them in their lives. Hatta kana Umar yakul until the point Umar said, Allahumma bayyin lana fil khamri bayhan and shafiyan. Until the point Umar made dua to Allah, Oh Allah, give us a clarification that will cure and treat this issue for us. He asked Allah, He made dua to Allah. But this ayah therefore only prepared them. For the prohibition, and it was and it it found its place in the hearts of the people. The prohibition, and then Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and then I mean before the unequivocal prohibition of it came down. This is because they realized that this sin was greater. He said, Sheikh Ibn Baz, that a group of the scholars begin to mention some of the benefits of alcohol that occurred for them through selling and buying and selling it and the wealth that they obtained from it like occurs today and what came of gambling and the wealth that people obtained from it some of the people while at the same time an abundance of evil occurred from it so sometimes you'll find a person he says that will do this would sell alcohol and become rich where others at the same time may become poor from it, lose everything from alcohol and gambling. And then others, it will be overwhelmed and they become alcoholic. Various scenarios came of it, rich, poor, so on and so forth. He said like this were the people who drank alcohol or out, who, who had this issue. And they bore witness to this reality. And this used to make occur to them some debates and arguing that occurred between them. People became killed as a result of alcohol because they lost their intellect. So they understood why Allah would say that, but they wanted more about it. They desired it. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came with the next level of this prohibition where Allah came and prohibited them from praying while in a drunken state. And Allah Ta'ala says, Ya in Surah Al Nisa, Ya ayyuhaladina amanu la taqrabu salata. O you who believe, do not go near the salat. Wa antum sukara hatta ta'lamu ma taqulun. He says, Allah, O you who believe, do not go near the prayer while you're in a drunken state. Had, until the point you know what you're saying. Surah to Nisa, verse 43. Meaning, you realize some of what you're saying while you're performing your prayer. And this occurred from the companions to ask this question because when Surah Al Kafirun was revealed, they, were recite, they couldn't recite, La a'budu ma ta'budun. I don't worship what you worship. When they was in a drunken state, they would say, A'budu ma ta'budun. I worship what you worship. And if they said this ta'amudin intentionally, they become a kafir saying that. 
So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they saw, wait a minute, this is affecting our prayers. Then Allah revealed this ayah. Prohibiting it in being in this drunken state while praying. As the narration has, has, has brought to us. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this prohibition unequivocally after that. Once the intellects and the hearts was prepared for the acceptance of this verdict from Allah Azza wa Jalla, because Allah is not going to reveal something that's not going to be followed. So, and Allah still wants to give us the choice. This is part of the definition La ikra hafidin. There's no compulsion in religion. So, Shaykh Ibn Baz, rahimahullah, he mentions that after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came with the unequivocal prohibition once the intellects and the hearts became accepting and prepared to accept this verdict of Allah. After the people knew the religion of Allah, after the true reality of Iman entered the, the depths of their hearts, and they begin to taste the sweetness of Iman. And at that point, they will rush to abandon it if the prohibition came down. They will rush to turn away from it. They will destroy what remained of it after Allah revealed his statement. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu innama al-khamru wal-maysiru wal-ansab wal-aznamu rijsun min amal al-shaytan fajtanibuhu la'allakum tuflihun Allah says in Surah Al-Ma'idah verse number 90 the table spread the fifth surah of the Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says O oh, you who believe, verily, alcohol, gambling, divining of arrows, slaughtering at altars, meaning in the name of other than Allah, is filth and from the, from the actions of shaitan, so avoid it, so that perhaps you may be, so that you will truly be successful. So here, Ibn Ibn says Allah connected success to the avoidance of this act in which was alcohol and gambling and slaughtering animals at altars for other than Allah and divining of arrows, meaning believing someone had control over bringing benefit and causing harm other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah ta'ala connected the abandoning of that to success. He said Allah connected to the altars in which they used to commit their shirk at them. And he connected to, to Aslam, to the, 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 divining of the, the divining of arrows, where they would take arrows and say, you know, you pick this arrow, you have a lucky day or something good happened or bad, you may have a bad day. They, they, Allah connected all of this, the abandoning of it. To believing someone else other than Allah has the ability to bring benefit or cause harm or anyone anything that the abandoning of all of these things and alcohol and gambling that all of that it will lead to success will lead to success and Sheikh Ibn Baz rahimahullah he then says so Allah connected success to the avoidance of these affairs and then he clarifies something of its corruption and its evil and so from the wisdom, so this is from some of the wisdom of his prohibition. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ الشَّيْطَانُ أَن يُوْقِعَ بَيْنَكُمُ الْعَدَاوَةَ وَالْبَغْضَاءِ فِي الْخَمْرِ وَالْمَيْسِرِ He said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, to clarifying the wisdom and what and of his evil. He says, subhanahu wa ta'ala, That shaitan only wants to cause to occur between you enmity and hatred in relation to the usage of alcohol and gambling. And to turn you away from the remembrance of Allah. And from prayer. So will you not therefore stop? 
so the Muslims stopped doing that. So they understood this reality. They understood the harms and all of this Allah said is religious, meaning filthy. All of it is rejected. All of it is falsehood. All of it is the actions of shaitan. And then he, when he said, so avoid it. So that you will truly be successful. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala connected success to these things. To this very day, this society don't even connect that to its purpose, reasons of why it's failing. And why the society is going down here. They still don't see that. Because you cannot see that except from the one who has created us Allah. Because he didn't put it into intellect to see that. So here the Shaykh Ibn Baz rahimahullah is clarifying how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dealt with affairs in the Quran. He says, so the Muslims, they stopped this act. And from that Umar, he said, Intahayna, intahayna. We stopped, we stopped. When he heard Allah says, Fahel antum muntahun. Will you not stop? Omar said, We stopped, we stopped, we stopped. Look how the companions, brothers and sisters, will respond to the book of Allah. Do you respond to the book of Allah like this? Do you read the Quran and then just say to yourself, Oh, Audhu Billah, I'm leaving that alone. Oh, Alhamdulillah, I'm upon this goodness. Oh, Alhamdulillah, this is what they did, I'm going to imitate them. Oh, Audhu Billah, this is what got them destroyed, I'm going to avoid that. Do we have this relationship with the Quran? Ask ourselves. Young people, ask yourselves, do you have this relationship with the Book of Allah Azza wa Jal? Like the Sahaba said, because it's a real speech of Allah. It's directly connected to your relationship. Like I have a conversation with Jamil right now. He's saying something, he tell me a story about something, I go, oh man, that's horrible. Subhanallah, for real? You can have that relationship with Allah, but only through his speech. It being recited off our tongues. It being connected to our everyday lives. But if you don't do that, Allah is dead to us, man. And you don't even realize it because you don't have this relationship with your Lord. Or we don't have this relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah said, this is why you can read the Quran and get bored and close and sit it down. Because it ain't real to you. You don't know why it was revealed and what occurred for it to come down. And what was his reason of revelation? What is the general lessons that's being given from him? We have none of this in our lives. Like how well we know the stats of LeBron James or these fools that's going to die on Kufa. I mean, that if they die upon their Kufa, they're going to hell forever. And so Shaykh Ibn Baz, rahimahullah, he clarified this reality. And Umar responded with that response. وَتَبَعُهُ الْمُسْلِمُونَ And all the Sahaba from amongst the Muslims follow saying the same thing. Intahayna, intahayna. We stop, we stop, we stop. وَتَبَعُهُ الْسَحَابَ وَتَرَكُوهَا And they all abandoned it. وَانْتَهَوْ مِنْهَا And they left it alone. وَأَمَرُوا بِإِرَاقَةِ مَا عِنْدَهُمْ وَأُمِرُوا بِإِرَاقَةِ مَا عِنْدَهُمْ And then they were commanded to spill whatever remained of alcohol into the streets of Medina. وَكَانَ الْغَالِبِ أَنَّ عِنْدَهُمُ الْخَمَرَ مِنَ التَّمَرِ وَالْبَصَرِ And it was alcohol that they poured that most of them made from dates and barley and, and grapes. And they did it from grapes rarely, which mostly is done here. And like this from this various types that they had. And what they did was they spilt it and poured it in the streets of Medina and they saved themselves from his evilness and they made enmity and fought wars against alcohol and alcoholism and drunkenness and its evilness. Because the intellect has now become an intellect in the place that it's supposed to be and what it was created for, which these people here has no taste or realization of, unfortunately. And then the Shaykh Hafizullah, he says after saying that, the Muslims made an agreement upon his prohibition and the companions had a consensus after that of his prohibition. And that is from the most worst of evil to the point the Prophet called it the mother of evil. Like this. So here the Shaykh Hafidullah trying to clarify for us, and my attempt here is to clarify this issue of how Allah 
dealt with things in the Quran. Before the beginning, he pray, he praised the alcohol. وَمِن ثَمَرَاتِ النَّخِيلِ وَالْأَعْنَابِ تَتَّخِذُونَ مِنْهُ سَكَرًا وَرِزْقًا حَسَنًا And of the benefits of the date tree and the vine tree of grapes that you take from it, alcohol and a goodly provisions. That's what he called it in the beginning. To لَا إِتْوَجْتَنِبُوا To avoid it. It's religious. It's filthy. From the actions of shaitan. He only wants to, to fling between you enmity and hatred. That's what alcohol does. People kill each other when they drink alcohol and do evilness to this very day. So here the Sheikh Hafidahullah. I hope he brought clear. Is made, has been made clear by him. The issue of alcohol. And how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gradually used the Quran to cultivate the Muslims. That we got to return to being having these characteristics with one another, with our families, cultivating them with the book of Allah, cultivating ourselves with the book of Allah. And then the Shaykh Hafidahullah, after that, he says, مفرقن, He said, these are from the most important objectives of the Quran and it's being revealed in portions and in, 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 in stages. وَتَبْقَى حُكْمُ كَثِيرٌ and still to this day, many of the wisdoms become apparent with the passing of the days in our lives. Until the point Allah takes the earth back and that which is on it. The wisdom of the Quran will still continue. The only problem is we ain't exposing ourselves to that book. So from there, inshallah ta'ala, who we wanted to share with everyone was some important points that we're going to cover we're going to cover next the collecting of the quran how it was collected during the time and preserved this that's going to be very enlightening and it's going to show how the sciences of islam was based off of this too it's going to be a tremendous benefit okay but what i wanted to share before we go into that is that we need to be familiar with the um Stages or the um, the subject matters that the Quran covers, with the subject matters that the Quran, the Book of Allah, Subhanahu wa Taala, it covers, and the scholars of Islam, and we're going to end with this. The scholars of Islam themselves, they broke that down into one instance, seven subject matters or three subject matters, and. The seven is branched off from the three. So you could say the subject matters that the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala covers is either three or it is seven. Okay? We start with the three. And you find this abundant in the Quran. La ma'buda bi haqqin illallah. That there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah. Allah constantly reminds us of that. And Allah talks about secondly That Muhammad Sallallahu has been sent As the messenger of Allah He reminds us of the messenger Muhammad messengership To confirm the following of him Second, thirdly That Allah promised those who fear him and obey him That he will enter them into Jannah and Paradise And he awada Al-Mushrikeen, he promises those who reject his message with the hellfire. These three subject matters is what the Quran comes covers in various ashkal, in various illustrations and examples. Hundreds of illustrations of examples till they reach the intellect through these various means. Because things is always understood through various things. It's like when you're a child, you see something, you get it. But after you experience it from various ways as you get older, you really get it. That's the difference between the one who's older with experience and the one who's new at experiencing something. So the Quran, this is how it was revealed. I mean, these are the subject matters that the Quran, it covers. And it's important for us to understand 
these subject matters. And understand that the Quran covers them in various forms. As even when we talk about the prohibition of alcohol, that's connected to what the attributes of the people taqwa is. So they get Jannah when they follow this prohibition. They get Jannah when they follow that prohibition. So it's important that we understand these realities. That these subject matters that the Quran covers, when we read the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we should be looking for the subject matters. And then, when we look at those subject matters broken up into seven categories uh, that we wanted to share with everyone, inshallah ta'ala, I don't want to misquote them, so I'm going to pull it up off of my phone. Uh, just give me a second. We gave a khutbah on, these, on this subject matter before too, before here on the minbar. The seven subject, the subject matters that the Quran covers. And it's important to be familiar because it's help us understand when you open the Quran, what, and then when you learn these, you open the Quran, you look for what, what, what's this subject falls under which category that you're reading from the book of Allah Azza wa Jal. And for some reason I can't find it. <laughs> But the seven one is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about Tawheed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about Tawheed. The Quran, the subject matter that it covers also is Ahkam, legal verdicts, giving legal verdicts for various situations. Number three, it covers Kissa, Kissa, stories that Allah tells us the stories of the prophets and the messengers. He tells us stories of the previous nations that he destroyed. So we could take lessons and admonitions from them. How many is that? Three? So what I, what I covered? Tawheed, Ahkam, Kisos, stories. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about Nabuwa, prophecy. Not just our prophecy of our messenger, not the prophecy, not just the prophecy of our messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but also the prophecy of all of some of 25 other messengers that Allah mentions in the Quran. So that we learn how they worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about, he gives promises of Jannah, wa'ad. He covers wa'ad, admonition, or promising for those who obey him and follow his legislation that they will get the Jannah and the paradise. Next point, he covers wa'id. He gives Threats for those who going to don't, who don't who does not follow his prophets and messengers. How many is that so far? That was six. Tawheed, I can't find it yet. Tawheed, Ahkam, Kisos, Nabuwa, prophecy. Wa'ad, number six is Wa'id. And not, I'm, I'm, I'm escaping me right now, number seven. Allah Musta'an. Escaping me right now, inshallah ta'ala. I'm gonna give me a second, I'm gonna find it. We're gonna end the class with that. But all of these seven is connected to the three that I first gave you. So the scholars either mention the three or they mention the seven. I think the seven is much more clear. In the fact that we understand is not something that you're going to read in a Quran, except that it's going to cover one of these seven things. And the only the surah that covers all seven is Surah Al Fatiha, because it's the opening of the book, where Allah Subhanahu wa Taala covers every one of these characteristics, that or every one of these subject matters that is mentioned in the Quran, that I cannot find where well, I had it in my notes. I have a, a, a notepad in here. And for some reason, it's escaping me. So it's, it's important that we understand. Inshallah ta'ala, after this, we're going to cover, as I said, the collecting of the Quran. We have a tremendous benefit that we want to abstract from that. 
And inshallah, if I find this, where I got this at, I'm going to tell you. It might be next week. No, that's not it either. To see what can No, that's not it either. I can't believe I can't find this. Okay. Hmm. Inshallah, Tyler, we'll come back next week with it. Uh, the seventh one is forgiven. It's, it's, past, it's escaping me right now. I apologize. But I learned this from Sheikh Abdullah ibn Muhammad Amin al-Shankiti, the son of Abdullah Muhammad Amin al-Shankiti, who brings in his book, Adwat al-Bayan. And his son taught it when he was doing the explanation. His son, who's from the major scholars of Medina, and he's a specialist in interpretation of the Quran. He covered in very great detail, took him seven years to explain the Quran and the Prophet's masjid one time. He's on his third time explaining it right now, uh, doing an explanation of the Quran. Alhamdulillah, I went through his explanation when he was doing tafsir al tabari uh, Alhamdulillah, it's accessible on the internet for those who can understand Arabic, inshallah ta'ala. But these are the subjects. So I said, Tawheed, Ahkam, Qasas, Nabuwa, Nabuwat, Wa'ad and Wa'id. What was the seventh one? SubhanAllah, man. It's escaping me. I apologize. Okay, with that, Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barik ala nabiyyina, I found it, Allahu Akbar. The seventh one is mi'ad, is mi'ad, being told about yawm al-qiyamah, being told about yawm al-qiyamah, Allah mentions it. So again, we repeat them, At the way order I gave you, tawheed, you don't have to keep it in this order, tawheed, ahkam, nubu, I mean, kisos, nubuwat, Prophecy, wad promises of Jannah for those who obey, wal waid threats of punishment, a hellfire for those who disobey, the prophets and messengers, and last but not least was miad, the day of judgment. Meaning, Allah tells us a lot was going to take place on the day of judgment. These are the seven subject matters that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala covers in the Quran, which some, as we said, the scholars mention them as three. Is, which I mentioned already That Allah, he is the one who is worshipping truth And that Muhammad has been sent from the Allah And that Allah promised those who confirm the truthfulness of this book The Jannah And he threatens with those who reject this book The Hellfire And what an evil end that is And these subject matters come in various illustrations In the Quran So that it can Settle in the minds and the hearts of the believers so they can live their life according to Iman. Now, Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum. Any questions? Was there any questions? I forgot about that. <clears throat>